2004. I have some of my uh, members of the entomology group and other master gardeners are here. If you raise your hand, uh, because they can answer questions too. And you didn't raise your hand. Uh, there's, uh, they can answer your questions too and maybe guide you if, if you have some questions on, on certain things. Um, I uh, taught biology and middle school science and the last thing I taught were my enthusiastic sixth graders. If you've got a kid that's that age or a little younger, get them into gardening because they, they love to do anything like that. Even a four-year-old can find one of these long before you can. <laughs> so, get them involved. Uh, can we uh, turn the back lights or some of the lights off, please? No, that wasn't it. Uh, is that better? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, the, um, this is Grow Your Own Vegetable Pests and Disease Management. You're not going to get rid of all of them, so you're going to have to, to manage them. Um, this is a tomato hornworm. If you grow tomatoes, you know what it is already. I do want to point out a few things on it. Um, see the dots along the edge? That's the way uh, insects transfer uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if you need to put one out or down, that's what you want to stop up. So you can put your foot on top of them sometimes or uh, you can use some soapy water or something like that to go along. Okay. Um, so there's about, I figured out four things. If you do these four things, whenever you're gardening or start gardening, I think you'll, you'll be successful. There is the Integrated Pest Management or IPM program, and we're gonna go through that. That's one thing, if you follow those strategies, that will really help. Be in the garden as much as you can, every day if possible. Go out, walk through. If you don't have a real plot or anything, if you're just growing things in pots, Go out and look at them every day, and that's when you'll catch the good things and the bad things that are there. The um, next thing is to, if, if you're gonna ask for help, you've got to figure out what's there. Uh, so you need to be able to find and identify them, uh, the, the pests or the, the disease, and so you can take pictures of that, you can, uh, those kinds of things in order to do that, and we'll talk about that. Um, and you want to welcome the good guys. There are so many good insects uh, in our gardens. You learn to recognize the difference between the good ones and the bad ones and encourage the good ones to be there. And there are other garden helpers too. So if you're out in the garden and you see it on the first day, a leaf that's looking kind of yellow, kind of stippled, maybe one or two, take those off right then, dispose of them, don't drop them on the ground. And then uh, if you wait a week and you go out and it looks like that one on the other side, you probably need to take that one out of the garden or at least cut off the really bad parts. Put those in a garbage bag and seal it up because you don't want the little things that are doing that to crawl out and get on something else. Okay, so a, uh, IPM is uh, an environmentally friendly, common sense approach to uh, controlling pests. So your goal as a home gardener is to grow stuff that you think is healthier, and uh, most people do. Uh, so what are the pests you're gonna be, what is a pest? A pest is an insect or another arthropod or a snail. Um, plant disease, weed, or other organism that negatively affects plant health. So we can have a lot of pests, but we don't forget the good things. So the key concepts are scout and monitor, identify the pest, recognize and diagnose plant damage, determine an action threshold. That means how much can I stand? If I've got one stink bug that has you know, made a hole in my tomato, that's one thing. If I've got a whole bunch, that's another. So you have to decide if you have too many and then you can, then there are other things you can do. 
and then apply the strategies, which we'll go through also. So we'll start with scouting and monitoring. Uh, hand picking means getting a getting a cup with, uh, and I like one with a handle. Put some soapy water in it, just water with a little soap. And if you're a little squeamish about touching, uh, you can <laughs> wear some gloves. Uh, and you just walk around your garden, and if you see the bad things, you put them in there. Then that soapy water is going to stop up the spiracles on the side, and that will help them go on to a better place. Um, there's a, another, thing, another thing you can do. This is really, this is not something necessarily to uh, get all of the insects out. This is a plastic bag with a piece of yellow paper. You can use blue paper. It's something that insects are attracted to. Uh, put Vaseline on it and you can hang it in your garden. And then they will be attracted to that and they'll stick to it. And then you can examine this later and see. This is not going to, uh, this is not going to really uh, do anything to the population necessarily, but it will let you see what's there. There are some traps that you can buy that do attract large numbers, uh, and that would be so, like the one on the, and it, they're usually for a specific so insect. Do we want to um, do we want to do? Sorry, I'm moving around too much for them. Uh, another thing you can do is, uh, if you see a lot of things, just use uh, a spray of water. And I forgot my, my fancy water wand. Uh, okay. <coughs> then, uh, if, you, if you have a magnifying glass, that works. Sorry, Ruben. Um, you can also get these little uh, jeweler's loops. You can buy them online. Uh, you may, I don't know where, where else you get them, uh, or a hand lens, and you can look at things up close. That helps you with identification. Uh, I always have this when I'm in my garden. Uh, and if you can't get them to be still, you can bring them in the house, put them in the, put them in the refrigerator for just about two minutes or so. <laughs> That'll slow them down. It's not, it may not, it won't kill them. <laughs> But it'll slow them down, and then you can look at them. Um, if you put them in the freezer, they're usually gone. Okay, I'll show everything on this side. I'll try, but I can't see right now. Okay, the other thing is containers to collect in. These little baby food things are great, um, and medicine bottles are great too. You can put the insect in your refrigerator. I know some people say, eh, but you've got, got some dead cow in there maybe if you're a bee feeder. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then uh, plants that have disease, you want to uh, put those in a plastic bag because you don't want to be spreading that around. And then you can look at that more carefully, look it up online, uh, send a picture of it to hotline, that sort of thing and you can uh, maybe get some identification. Uh, the other thing is our phone. We didn't have that for so long, but now we can get really good photos with our phone. They need to be good and clear and you can send that picture then to Hotline and they can help you identify it. Or you can try using some of the apps that are available now. Uh, you can use um, Google Lens is the one that we started out using and it's pretty good. Uh, then there's Seek, uh, which uh, I know some of our folks use uh, for Apple phones. Um, there's one called Picture This, but you want to check those out before you download them. Be sure, how uh, look to see how they're collecting any information on you, that sort of thing. Uh, but you'll usually get a, almost an instant answer from those. Uh, I would advise you, if you get an answer, write it down, then go to a reputable site like bugguide.net or a university. Uh, I think this is, I think I put that in the uh, resources in there. <coughs> or reputable university, any of the land grant universities, uh, A&M's 
pretty good. Uh, University of Florida's good. University of North Carolina's good. Purdue, it's getting a little farther away, is good. Uh, those, those can uh, usually have some, some pictures. So you would take the name that Google Lens gave you, then you would put it into your computer and uh, see what, what comes up, and then that will help you identify for sure what you got. Okay, the other thing you've got to remember is that baby insects don't look like, um, like adult insects. So kind of be aware of the fact that you don't have four different things in your garden, you've got one that's growing. So <clears throat> if they go through a, a simple metamorphosis, the eggs are laid. This is the, the, the leaf-footed bug. If you're a gardener already, you know that one. Okay, that's the leaf-footed bug. They, this particular one, <coughs> lays its eggs in a long string. It may be on the side of your house, it could be on a plant, it could be on a piece of equipment that you left outside. Uh, and then lots and lots of little insects are gonna come out of that. They stay together in a bunch and then they grow and they molt and then they make a, a, an adult. <coughs> so even when they're little, they're eating your plants. Uh, the one on the other side here is the uh, lady beetle. Uh, she lays a little, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of lady beetles, by the way. She lays her eggs on a, on a uh, well, just about anything, but it's always on a plant somewhere. Uh, and they are, this particular one has yellow eggs. It makes that little thing up there that has, doesn't look anything like a lady beetle. Uh, but it is ferocious and it eats lots of tiny insects. So you want to be sure you keep that one in your garden. And then the pupa looks something like that, and then the adult comes out. So uh, those are things that you want to be aware of. It may not be a separate bug, it may be something else. For pests, and um, I mean for diseases and uh, other things, uh, insects too, you might want to um, one of the, the uh, strategies is to recognize plant damage and determine action threshold. That's a good way of saying, how much of this can I stand before I do something? So that's what you want to look at. If you see a plant like that skeletonized leaf up there, and you got just two to three, take your clippers and clip those off and throw them away. Look and see if there's something in the back. If you got a whole plant that looks like that, then you better, you better do a little bit more. Um, the other one, those little creamy colored dots that are up there are aphids. So that's a lot. They, uh, some people might think they were spider mites. Either way, they're not good for your plant. So take that leaf off, look and see if there's somewhere else. Um, but you've got to figure out for your, on your own how much you can stand of this. Uh, diseases down at the bottom. Uh, look at all the plants in your garden at the same time. If this one's got it, does that one have it next to it? So those are, those are some strategies. Determine what, what you can stand and what you want to take care of. Contact hotline or the uh, county agent to find out what to do. So you're going to use a combination of all of these strategies to avoid and uh, prevent some, some uh, pest problems. Cultural practices means having good soil, planting the right plants for your zone, wearing 9B. Uh, planting the right plants in the right place at the right time. So this time is not the time to plant new little plants. Um, plant resistant varieties, you can find out whether a variety is resistant or not. You've got to know the name of the plant and then you can look online and they'll tell you what it's resistant to. So if you're from a, a, a squash grower, if there is a squash seed or plant that you can get that's resistant to the uh, the borer that gets in the stem, then that's the one you probably want to buy if there aren't any of those. Uh, and then crop rotation uh, means not planting something in the same spot every, every year. Don't plant your tomato in the same spot um, because you've got insects that lay their eggs in the, in the soil uh, and you really can't plant anything in the tomato family, which are the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes, they all have the same kind of flower. Uh, their flowers are uh, kind of odd. Uh, squash, cucumber, melons, and pumpkins are the same family. Cabbage, broccoli, kale, mustard, collops, 
tolerance and turnips price. Uh, maybe turnips are up there twice because tur turnips are root crop and they can get um, things that bore into the into the turnip, but they can also get um, other other things that will damage the greens. Mechanical practices means to remove pests, but be sure they're pests. Uh, remove plants uh, with heavy infestations or disease symptoms. Spray with water or soapy water. You want to spray up under them. You can get some really neat uh, wands that turn the nozzle up so you can get the water under there. Don't use a pressure washer, but you can use, you can use a pretty hard spray, but not that hard. Uh, you can spray it with a little handheld thing with soapy water or just water. That sometimes helps. Um, keep your garden area free of infected debris. So if anything falls off, if you think has a disease, pick it up. And at the end of the garden, be sure you don't leave any of that stuff on the ground. Um, you, you can use row covers. Um, and if you're not growing a lot of things, if you've got a tomato in a cage and you're concerned, you can wrap the cage with something. I use tool like uh, bridal veils are made out of, little girls made tutus made out of, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not as cheap as it used to be, but it's pretty cheap, it's 54 inches wide. Don't get the kind that's on a spool that's only 12 inches or you'll be wrapping it around yourself. Uh, but go ahead and get the big ones. You can put it over a, a short row or something. And mine has lasted a long time. I do take it off and, and bring it in the house, but it's lasted a long time. Or you can buy the the um, the kind that is a non-woven substance and put those over it. Um, I think uh, you saw if you came last month, uh, Larry had his tomato cages really wrapped up uh, with uh, I don't I'm not sure what he used. I think it was green though. <clears throat> uh, Keep your plants off the soil. When we go out in the garden out there, you'll see that squash plants, tomato plants, everything are up off the soil because that's where a lot of diseases can get started. <clears throat> okay, some biological practices. That says protect your, your friends. They're going to work for you. These are just some of them. First one up there is a wheel bug. I've got a live one back there. Then we've got the robber fly. We, under the wheel bug, we have the assassin bug. This little thing just goes to town eating stuff. So you want to keep those. The eggs are laid in that hexagonal shape. It's not round. It's a little angular. And uh, the babies start eating pretty young. And so you want to try to keep those in your garden. Uh, back up to the top, the robber fly, then down. We've got the little dim, uh, little, um, um, I can't think, uh, lace wing. And uh, the eggs and lace wings are laid on a stalk. So if you see those anywhere, leave them. Uh, they'll lay them on anything. They lay them on your hoe handle. They'll lay them on a plant. Uh, so, so watch for those. Their um, little uh, nymph looks like a, um, a little alligator, sort of. But some of them also will pile debris from your garden on top of them. You can see the legs underneath that little white fluff. So if you see that going across the plant, that's a good little guy, just kind of trying to blend in. Um, the um, praying mantis, we all know. The babies are tiny, tiny. I don't know if you can see it, but that's a baby on that pencil. Uh, you can buy the eggs when you start buying insects to release. There's no way of keeping them in your yard. So it might not be a really good investment. Uh, spiders, my goodness, they eat a ton of stuff. So if you see one scurrying across the ground, especially one that's got a little white egg case on the back, leave them there because they'll eat a lot of, uh, a lot of insects. Uh, back up to the top, um, we have these little uh, flies. We have uh, flower flies, serpent flies, other things that are pretty small, and they kind of hover around the flower, but when they they lay their eggs, then that little critter right up there at the very top comes out and it eats eggs of other insects. And so those are good ones to keep in your garden. And uh, the, uh, there's some brown beetles that look a little ferocious, but that's what you want. So leave them. Uh, 
The uh, lady beetles, there's a bunch of different kinds. There's four kinds up there. That little tiny black one is very small, but those and their, uh, uh, over there, the little mop looking thing, that's their baby. Those are, will eat aphids all day long. So you want to be sure you look and you keep those. We've got uh, a lot of different kinds here. Their eggs, uh, uh, for the, the red and black lady beetles are always yellow. I'm not sure about the rest of them. Then down at the bottom, the thing that nobody wants in their yard is a wasp. Mm -hmm. But what do they feed their babies? Mm -hmm. Insects. So you want to encourage them. I know we don't like mud daubers on our house, but uh, they will fill themselves <coughs> up and keep going back and forth to feed their babies. And the uh, little bamboo stakes, if you're staking plants, those are great because there's a hole, there's a little wasp that will uh, lay its eggs in there and then provision it with caterpillars all day long. And you gotta admire them, my goodness, that, that mud dauber built that nest with a mouthful of mud at a time. So, so they're really tenacious, they work hard. The one there uh, in the last, the back, last corner over there, that's a little potter's wasp. She makes that cute little pot. It may be on your screen, it might be uh, somewhere else in your garden, but she fills it up. That one that I broke open, those are all caterpillars that were in there. That's when we were, the year we were having a big problem with the sod rail worms in our yard. So if you had a whole bunch of those, that would have really helped. And then you've got other garden friends. You've got birds, little wrens, well, they'll be all over the place. So keep them, uh, the anoles, that one's eating a good bug though. Toads, frogs, snakes. The one we find out here a lot is a little brown snake. It's only about a foot long, but it will eat things. And then the spiders, like we talked about a while ago. So, chemical use. I think I saw Boone come in. Uh, uh, use either uh, you can use either biopesticides or synthetic pesticides. Biopesticides are made from um, living things, like a bacteria, uh, which is what BT is. And, and then there's some others. Um, I don't like to recommend those. Uh, if, uh, if you have a problem and you think you want to use something like that, then that's fine. Uh, then uh, if you use a pesticide, uh, the others are the synthetic pesticides, which are usually, uh, a lot of times they're a derivative of some kind of petroleum product. Those are a little bit more damaging, in my opinion. But do consult an expert. Go to Hotline and ask. They'll, they can maybe ask Boone, uh, something like that. The person who's stocking the shelves at the store may not be the one you want to ask. So, so think about that. Read the, instru read the instructions about what it's going to do, that sort of thing. And then if you figure out which one is going to target the pest that you want to eliminate, read the directions, follow them. Uh, if you use it too much, too strong, then, uh, then you're kind of defeating your purpose. You don't want to kill all of those good things that, that are in your yard. It will take longer for the population of the good things to increase than it will for the bad things. Why? Because the good things eat the bad things. So if they don't have anything to eat, they can't, they can't uh, repopulate your garden. Um, wear protective gloves, protect your eyes, wash your hands, clothes if you get it on after you use these, don't use them on a windy day. Containers should be permanently labeled that this is for pesticide only, or this is for if you're using herbicides, this is for herbicide only. Don't use the one for herbicides uh, to put a pesticide in. Uh, that might take care of your problem real quick. Uh, clean your spraying containers, including the hose and the nozzle. Clean those well after you use them. Okay, so we're going to talk about insects now. These are insects with chewing mouth parts. That means that usually they chew like this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they don't all do that. The cabbage looper is one that will be on your cabbage. It will also be on your uh, tomato. 
and your peppermint. And it's green, it's hard to see. Wrens love them. They will go through your garden and get lots of these. Uh, it makes a moth like that, which you would probably never see. If you see something like that at the bottom, this was on a tomato plant at my house. Uh, this caterpillar, and they're little, uh, had made a cocoon on, on the plant. It's covered with silk. And uh, I was looking at it one day and I thought, whoa, I wonder what that is. And then I realized that there were all of these little paras parasitic wasps that were coming out of it. So I want to leave that there. Look at how many you got. Look at how many of those are there that can parasitize a caterpillar and take care of everything for you. So you want to be sure and look carefully. Oh, the one that everybody loves is the squash vine borer. Um, this is uh, an example of what it looks like. It's a caterpillar. The, uh, the moth looks a little kind of like a wasp, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if, if anybody really comes up with a good way to discourage them, but there's tons of things that you can look at online. I ask some of the master gardeners who do a lot of vegetable gardening, and they say, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, so there are things you can do. One thing is to keep them up off the ground, uh, the squash. Uh, you can also get traps if you want to spend the money that have a fair amount in it that will attract those. The cutworm, uh, it's the one that likes to get your baby plants that are coming up out of the ground. So one of the things that you can do for them is to use a uh, can, put it around your, uh, around your plant when it comes up. Uh, you don't have to use one this big. However, remember, if you leave it on there a long time, you've got to get it off some way. So if the plant gets too big, you're in trouble. Um, you can also make uh, collars out of cardboard, uh, and those you can cut apart uh, whatever. So, uh, and if you use certain kinds of cardboard, it'll uh, biodegrade. Uh, so these all have chewing mouth parts, and so do these. Tomato fruit worm. Um, that doesn't look very good, but if you get those, uh, they're, they're inside the plant, probably by the time you discover it. Uh, sometimes you can go ahead and eat the fruit, but sometimes, I don't know if I'd eat the other, the second one with the uh, fruit worm. Okay, and then we've got the hornworm. The hornworm can also be parasitized, so if you see one that's got those little uh, cocoons on it, leave it there. A lot of times they'll turn, they'll be green, and then eventually they'll turn black, and those little tiny wasps will come out. So there, you, you just produced a whole crop of those things. Every one of them can lay eggs on another hornworm. So leave that one, it's not gonna be eating anymore. Okay, beetles, uh, flea beetles, you can see the evidence of them out in the garden. They eat little holes and things, they're different kinds, they're called flea beetles. You'll notice that their uh, uh, hind leg is a little bigger. Uh, all species of flea beetles don't have that. The ones we have out there are kind of part of brown, uh, but they still can move real fast. They eat little tiny holes in the leaves. Uh, the cucumber beetles are, you can have the spotted ones or the uh, striped ones. They eat leaves, uh, the babies eat leaves. The, uh, they can also transmit uh, a virus. And we know with viruses, not much you can do. Uh, the Colorado potato beetle is a little striped thing and they do go after leaves. Their larvae look uh, a little bit different. Wireworms uh, eat into roots. Um, they are the click beetle. If you've ever caught one of these, you lay it on its back and then it's able to use, uh, to click and turn itself over. Fireflies and click beetle. Um, they eat into uh, root plants, uh, or the root of things. You might have even gotten a sweet potato at the grocery store and it had a few little holes in it. That's probably what did that. Grasshoppers and katydids, uh, they, I will say this year I have seen more in my yard and a little bitty one can eat a lot. So you want to try to, to catch those and get away with them or go fishing. Um, insects with piercing sucking mouth parts. These um, do a lot of damage uh, and they get out of control quick. Um, the aphids are probably 
something that everybody's had or seen. They're very interesting insects. They come in all colors. They can be black, they can be red, they can be uh, yellow. Uh, the yellow ones are the ones that uh, we, I see most often in my garden. You've got some of them in the butterfly garden that are, are kind of red like uh, those up there. They, uh, they can have wings. They can not have wings. They can lay eggs. They can not lay eggs. They can have babies without laying eggs. They can have babies without mating. So, man, they've got it made. They, they, we're not going to get rid of them, probably. Uh, if we, uh, if you could look real close, that one big one at the bottom is uh, having a baby alive. So, so they can do that. Um, the over on the other side, uh, we've got the little circuit fly larvas that are in the uh, in the mass of, and they're eating. They're eating those aphids. So if you see something like that, that's a good thing. And then you've got the other one down at the bottom. They produce honeydew, which is a sweet liquid from all of that uh, juice they're sucking out of your plants. Um, and it will fall on the plant, then sooty mold will, will start to grow. You can wash that off. You can wash these off. They don't crawl back up the plant very easily. So you can wash these off. And uh, the white things are their exoskeleton that they, when they grow and they mow. Uh, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers, I'm seeing those this year. I don't know about anybody else. Uh, they, if there's a lot of them, they can cause yellowing of the leaves and can cause a lot of damage. Usually you notice the stippling, little white dots on things first. And uh, I'm seeing a lot of the flatted uh, ones, those little fuzzy ones. And on the stem, and I, and I have some of those, one of those back there. White flies, uh, there can be a million of them. Uh, if you turn your, the leaf over, they're, uh, they're all on the bottom. They're, their babies are on the bottom. Their eggs are on the bottom. They're everywhere. Uh, so those you can, you can try to get rid of uh, by removing that. But you need to disable them a little bit, so spraying them with water, that sort of thing helps, but um, not always. Um, some of those are also capable of spreading disease. Leaf miner makes those little squiggly lines or straight lines in your plant. Uh, they don't really cause too much damage unless they get so bad that they, they stop the uh, photosynthesis from going on with your plant. Uh, if you see just a few, take those leaves off. Once they, um, they come out and make a pupa, it's a fly, uh, or fly, so I think some of them may be lost. Um, they pupate in the ground, so they're going to be there to come back next spring. So um, you want to try to get, get them off. That little fly over there is only eight hundredths of an inch long, so you're probably not going to see this. You'll see them in the mines. If you take one of those off, if it hasn't gone out the edge, if you take one of those off and hold it at the light, sometimes you can see it in there. Um, the leaf-footed bug, I think uh, you've already heard from some of you that you know what a leaf-footed bug is. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, there's several different kinds. Um, the one at the bottom uh, is big. The other one with the stripe on it is not quite so big, but they both do the same thing. They suck the juices out of your plant. Um, squash bug over there. Um, there can be tons of those um, on your squash plants. Um, they, their eggs are sort of reddish colored. Their babies are grayish. <coughs> they stay together in a group, so you can smash a bunch of them at once if you want to, if you can fast enough. Um, but the soapy water thing is, is good for those. Um, now that's the squash bug. The borer is a different, different insect. Um, stink bugs, there's a whole variety of those. I've already heard about those this morning in people's gardens. Um, they're, uh, they're green, they're brown. Uh, the picture over there in the corner shows what their mouth part looks like. It's a long stylet and it will, it can poke into your plant when it when any of these poke into your plant with that. <clears throat> they also inject a, an enzyme <clears throat> to make it a little bit easier for them to get the juices out. 
and that's what starts causing the rotting of the fruit, that sort of thing. The one that says good on it, you notice that he's got those spines on his shoulders. <clears throat> those are, um, that's the way you tell that that one is a good one. So the, um, and then we have the marmorated stink bug, which is not, which is a little new to the area that's, that's bad too. These are also, you talked about, I'm talking to you, we talked about, I've got one, uh, talking about these uh, with some of you. Uh, these are all big, a lot of these are really big agricultural pests too. So uh, you're not alone. Think about the guy that's got 50 inches of tomatoes. So that's uh, the spider mites and nematodes are not insects. Spider mites are rel relatives of spiders, and they're the ones that make that stippling. If you have a white card piece of paper, you can hold it under the leaf and tap the leaf, and sometimes they'll fall off, and you'll see them moving around. Uh, they uh, they they just eat it, and they make it look their plants look horrible, and they, um, they you know, turn yellow and uh, the leaves may curl up, they may turn brown. Uh, those can be washed off too. They don't crawl back up very easily either. Um, the nematodes are a, uh, actually a worm. Uh, a lot of the caterpillars are called worms, they're not worms, they're caterpillars. But this is actually a worm, a, a little uh, round worm. That picture at the bottom, the little squares over there, those, that's a cell in the root. So that's showing you how that those things are really tiny at this particular stage. They're there, there's a lot of them there, and they cause the knots on uh, the root, the roots of plants. Your legumes, beans, peas, that sort of thing will also have some knots, but those are good knots, because uh, those are nitrogen-fixing plants. Okay, let's see. So, management techniques. What are you going to do? So, you're going to, we've talked about this a little bit before, plant disease resistant varieties. Look at the seed packet. It'll give you some information. Um, the, there are some lists, and it's in the, the last slide. There are some lists that are on our website that tell you varieties that work in our area. And then you can look those up. If you buy your plants at our Master Gardener plant sale, your vegetable plants, or other Master Gardener plant sales, they should be varieties that will grow here and you shouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, practice proper sanitation in your garden. Not just at the end of the season, but all, all the time. If you can, don't water overhead because that, unless you do it early enough that the plant can dry out because that invites disease. Uh, remove any plants, I think we've said this over and over, keep it clean, remove diseased plants, put diseased plants in a bag and don't put them in the compost. You can mulch with different things. Uh, avoid planting the same plant family where they have been planted in the past 24 months. Is been 24 months too long? What? That works. that works? Okay. So you're going to have to move them around a little bit. The other thing that, that I've noticed is uh, in my neighborhood, people are planting vegetables in their front yard. And so, and then we have other master gardeners that just grow them in their yard or a pot on the patio. <clears throat> so are there places where you can do that? You may need to change the soil out in a pot that, or something like that. But come uh, cooler weather, uh, if you wanted to grow some kale or some spinach, something like that, that looks pretty good in your front yard. So don't do pansies, do some greens. <laughs> uh, you can also grow those in a pot. Uh, and you can get, you may not get as much as you would if you had a big long row, but you'll get some. Uh, the, uh, uh, you may also uh, plant uh, tomatoes. The people in my neighborhood, do they have the neatest yard in the neighborhood? Lots of flowers, so pretty. But I noticed last uh, last year, not this year, last year they had this little tripod thing set up, and then pretty soon there were tomatoes growing on it. As soon as they got started looking bad, and they had harvested some, 
it was gone. But you can you can do that. Nobody's going to say anything, and if they do, you can tell them you're feeding your family. Okay. <laughs> when possible, train vegetables to grow in a cage or a trellis. I, d I don't know that we emphasize that enough here, but with our humidity and our either wet or dry, that sort of thing, that really does help to get them up off the ground. You may not have anything as fancy as what we've got out there, but a big tomato cage uh, really does help. <clears throat> not just around tomatoes, it can be used around other things, or some kind of trellis that you make or buy. And harvest your fruit before it's fully ripe. Fully ripe things uh, do attract pests. Okay, the diseases. Uh, a lot of these things, you, you, don't, you can't tell which one's which. But if it's a, it does turn out to be a big problem to you, you be sure that you get a picture at the hotline and that you ask a, an expert uh, about what it is. Um, they can occur at just about any time during plant growth. Uh, they, um, determining, this, like I said, determining what it is is, all, is sometimes rather difficult. Environmental factors, rain, heat, that sort of thing plays a part in how bad they get. Um, you can look for things like stunted or distorted growth on your leaves. Uh, flowers or the fruit or just the plant in general, spots, other markings on the upper or lower leaf surfaces or fruit. Decay on the stems like clotting, softening, that sort of thing. Um, note when they started, did it start after a big rain or something like that? Did it not start until we had that and then a few days later you saw the, this uh, yellowing or whatever you're seeing, browning of the root, of the leaves, uh, is the root rotting, those kinds of things. You need, we need to know that if we're gonna help you uh, figure out what it is. How many plants are affected? Is it just one plant in your row or is it all of them? So that, that's also something that helps. So these are a few. They don't always look the same on, on plants, but these are just a few. Damping off is at the bottom of the plant where it comes up out of the ground. It's usually because it's too wet and that's a fungus and the, there's nothing you can do now. It's gone. Um, rust is usually <coughs> rusty colored and it can be spots, it can be long streaks and things on things. Powdery mildew is usually white uh, and it will eventually cause a, a browning of the area. Downy mildew is sometimes brown if you, or lighter colored. If you turn the leaf over, it'll be darker uh, spores underneath. Uh, if you can spare the leaves, take them off. And uh, light uh, spots, but then you're going to have spots for a lot of the others too. Those really do a number of fruit. Uh, reticulum wilts is just another one causes uh, damage later in the season. Usually these are others are usually early in the season. You can have spots on your plants, like I said, bacterial spot usually has a, a halo around it um, and it's dark in the center. If you go down to canker, it's got white spot in the middle with a yellow spot around it. Those sorts of things. If you've got a whole, whole big bunch of stuff that wilts, that's probably wilt, that may only affect one or two plants. If you have melons and they lay on the ground, they'll get this splotch. It may not affect the taste, but if you were trying to sell that, it might not go over too well. Viral diseases, we know a lot about viruses now. We know they're not cured. There is no vaccination for plants, anything like that. They cause a, a mosaic look on leaves. If it's a mosaic virus, then the spotted wilt virus makes spots. Uh, on plants. I don't think I've ever seen that, but that looks pretty bad. The mo tomato mosaic virus uh, causes even splotches on the tomatoes. Uh, this tomato mosaic, tobacco mosaic, we used to think it was a long time ago, we thought it was the same thing. It was one of the first viruses that was studied. 1850s was studied because it infected tobacco, not because it infected necessarily tomatoes. Uh, so here's the hotline, uh, use it, you can call that number, you can uh, leave a message, 
Uh, you can send them a picture with a note uh, about what, what you're seeing, where you live, what your garden is like, that sort of thing, give them as much information, and they will get back to you. May not be that day, but they will get back to you. We have a group, uh, we've got some online people here, uh, I think. Uh, so, so they do have a group of people, and I think they're here, somebody here nearly every day of the week uh, to check those out. And these are some resources. There is a good Google Lens uh, little tutorial um, by a young man at uh, A&M. He tells you kind of, walks you kind of through it if you're going to use that one for identification. There are plenty of recorded presentations at Aggie Horticulture Facebook page. You can just go look that up, and there's all kinds of things you can look at. Um, Vegetable planting guides and the recommended ve vegetable varieties are on our website under vegetable gardening. And the Galveston County Master Gardens have a, a, a great website with lots of beneficials in it. And uh, the, uh, the one uh, from Purdue is a lot of things <coughs> gardeners should know about pesticides. I thought that one was really good. Uh, it has to do with landscape ornamentals as well as vegetable. And uh, Garden IPM is um, the National Pesticide Information Center. And it can tell you about pesticides if you're thinking about using those. So any questions right now for me? And we've got Boone back there. We've also got some people back there at the back that can help. We've got posters for our uh, beneficial insects and our pest insects. And we've got some live things over there and some boxes that show those also. Okay. Uh, yes. I have a question about diseases. Uh huh. I, I did some one this year, and yesterday I was looking and plucking and tilling and harvesting, and I found one of the corn snake. Do I need to destroy all of it, take up pull all of it? Oh, there you are. <laughs> What smut she thinks is what it is on her corn. Yeah, well, it depends on who you ask. Some culinary experts think that that's a that's a prized gift that you've got there. There's a, there's a hard fungi. That, yeah, there's a hard fungi that'll grow on on corn, but it usually it's just it's very spotty and cyclical. Main thing, like Nancy said, is crop rotation. So uh, if you're seeing that becoming a problem more commonly. Like uh, if you plant corn next year and you see more of that, then just take a year off uh, of, of corn in the garden, plant something else, um, and then you, you kind of break the cycle. That's the idea of that 24 month rotation, is that if you have spores, whether it's disease, uh, bacterial or, or fungal disease, that the spores get into the soil, um, they don't persist that long if they don't have that suitable host. So the rest of the corn is okay, yeah. I already took, yeah, took care of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're fine. But yeah, do a little research on that. Um, I, don't, I don't know, anybody know what the name of that is? The Spanish name for it? Yeah. Coco or something? Yes. Uh, yes. And it's it's a lot of culinary people it. use that. <laughs> so oh. for some people it's a terrible thing, and for some people it's the best thing. So they cook with it? Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Like That's a truffle. Good. Maybe it's good. It's kind of weird. Okay. Another question. Somebody over here had one. Uh huh. Uh, good question. Uh, we had like a horde of crab spiders last year, last few years, but this past year we don't see any. But we are seeing bag spiders. Is it? Whatever that spider you got is good, because they they. They feed on insects. That's what they do. So they're all good. Are you talking about the little red and yellow? Uh, what were you were calling crab spiders? Crab, the crab spiders. Look at all the different kinds. Of okay, no, we left good. those. But but this year we went out there. And there's there's no crab spiders in our yard. Oh, it's well, really weird. And all of a sudden we saw. I mean, we found a we found a back spider climbing on our flower thing. But the back end of it was this big around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want that landing on me. <laughs> well, it, it's not going to land on you, and they make a big, big web, and insects fly into it. It's good. Those are pretty cyclical in my yard. I don't have any this year. A couple of years ago, I had a lot. 
uh, the little um, uh, gar you know there's a lot of little spiders that I see more of one year than another but they're but they're all good and you'll see them in your garden or you won't see them in your garden because they're camouflage but they're there doing a good job what about neem oil? Neem oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good, um, uh, you know, there's a, a plant byproduct uh, or a plant oil based insecticide. Um, one thing probably, you know, peaking up into 100 degrees, uh, any, anything that says oil on it, even if it is organic, that's uh, something we're going to be real careful with so we don't burn the plant foliage. Uh, so it may hold off a little bit or apply those. Uh, oil or soap products this time of year, like late in the evening or early, early, early in the morning, to try to avoid um, foliar burn on the plant. That's that's true. I, I don't know about a lot of you, but I probably have had more in, bad insects in my yard this year than I have in a while. Um, and that this year is the first year I've ever used. I have used a pesticide in many, many years, and I did use that. But you do have to be careful. With so I have a question about mealy bugs, which I'm sure like the thing of everybody's existence. Um, they were really bad last year on our great myrtles. And I used some neem oil and I had like some ladybugs, but not that many, right? So like the good stuff, the good insects do not quickly enough take care of it. So what's that balance between trying to treat for it before it just completely like overtakes your tree and not wanting to kill the ladybugs? Nice. Um, well, if it's really mealy bug, then yeah, they're not the destroyers. They're so not the okay. Uh, I'm not seeing them as bad this year because I actually sprayed with them a little early in the season. But mm -hmm. I'm just trying to know what to do if it comes back as bad as it was last summer. Which is okay, and you're sure it's not scale. I mean, I can see the little bugs. Well, <laughs> yeah. So there's a range of soft body insects that get on crepe myrtle. Yeah. And usually all, what we see is, is the, uh, the sooty mold, the black mildew on the yeah. foliage or on the branches. It's yes. kind of a sign that there's something in there. Yeah. So it could be mealybugs, could be white fly, could be <coughs> aphid, probably scale insect. Uh, nonetheless, they're all doing the same thing. They're sitting yeah. up there slurping on the foliage, pooping on the leaves, and then that turns into this black sooty mold and you get into this stress cycle. Uh, probably the easiest thing is just Put your water nozzle yeah. in like jet mode and go out there every couple days and just blast the bottom of the foliage, blast any of that black sooty mold. Uh, most of the soft body insects like to get in the little crevices, yeah. like at the petioles, the leaf bases, underneath the leaves, uh, little branches, if there's little wedges in there. Just take, just take water and just blast all that off. Like Linda said, once those, once those soft body insects fall on the ground, they're probably gonna be predated by, by other bugs on the ground and they're not going to make it back on the plant. And you have to kill the beneficial. Yeah. Um, I would say look up crate myrtle bark scale too, because part of that can be uh, white. And that's yeah. bad. It might have been a combination of the two. Like I yeah. did all that. Well, okay. the bark scale is pretty bad. Yes. Yeah, it's good. There's a little satisfaction in just blasting them. There it is. Like, <laughs> so, so when they were like really bad, I would go out with like my car keys and like flip oh. them off every morning, you know, before okay. I got my car. But it could take hours. It probably like a glass so of water would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really does help. Or yeah. More than using a pesticide. Because really the mealy bugs are the ones that have like when you squish them, they have like the pink. Or scale does that too. <laughs> You might have bark scale. You might have bark scale. Bark scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, look it up and and look at it. That yeah. one's that one's pretty bad. Yeah. And you know, oh, I'm not going to give my opinion about the <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't play that. So. You you talked about um, spraying with soapy water. Is that ever an issue? Like, will that ever hurt the plant? Well, if you get too much soap, but if you just put a little bit of soap in a little hand sprayer. It, it shouldn't hurt. Uh, the plants do have stoma, little holes in the in their leaves <coughs> for the transfer of, of oxygen and, and uh, carbon dioxide. So you don't want to, you know, damage it too much. Uh, but a little bit of soap, and, but water works just as well, almost as, as soapy water. Okay. So soapy water kind of slows some of the bitter ones down a little bit. Oh, okay. yeah. 
Yeah, very, very light. So if you're using like your dishwasher, uh, liquid dishwashing soap, it's like five to 10 drops <coughs> in a 24 ounce spray bottle. So we're not talking about much, much soap at all. We're not there. talking about making a lot of suds. Yeah. 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 yeah, there is some, I read some things about, uh, you know, so many soaps and things have all kinds of stuff in them now. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you use some products that don't have so much of that, then you might, I don't know that they would damage your plants or not, but kind of go, go with the milder things. Yeah, go ahead. Question. I, I planted uh, green beans in uh, kind of like a square foot garden, a couple four foot squares. And uh, in one, one square, it all got rust. In the other square, it's as green as can be. What can I do to the square that got the rust? I, I pulled the plants out and threw them away, but what can I do to that square to make sure that the next time I plant beans there, that they'll actually not have the rust problem? Is there something I can do to the, to the dirt or anything? So same, just ro rotating. Sure. So legumes, so you take everything that's beans and peas, everything that's in that family, and probably just pull them out of that spot for that amount of time, a season or two, to minimize the suitable host, and then the spores will minimize, and then you'll be back in good shape. You put anything that that will feed on those those act, uh, soil active spores. The, um, you can plant other things there that are not susceptible to that. So you're not going to get naturally fallow necessarily. How do you know what's not susceptible? How, what's not acceptable? What do you mean? Not susceptible. When you oh, say you can you, plant something okay. else, how do you, you look, know what to plant? You go okay. in the go well, in you line. Go to, go to those lists, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you what they're resistant to. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I can get back to that one very quick, but uh, yeah. anybody well, have the cheater way is just you just go online. Just, the internet is, is pretty accessible yeah, these days. But just do garden crop rotation, just in a in a skew, and it you know mm -hmm. you're looking at plant family. So okay. like uh, the cucurbits is all your melons and squash and all that type of stuff. So all that it's got a range of hosts, whether it's insects or disease that's pretty specific mm -hmm. to those. And then you got stuff like your tomatoes and peppers and and your eggplant, they're all in the, that nightshade, the Solanaceae family, so they have all similar pests. So when we say about crop rotation, it's not like we're not going to put a pepper where we have the tomato because we haven't accomplished anything. We're planting something that has similar issues. So we got to move all those out of that spot, but we can come in there with a whole other plant family that's not going to have those issues. Yeah. You can, and, and also, if you were talking about which ones are resistant, is that what you were asking? No, that's the, he answered oh, what okay. I was saying, okay. how do I know which crop to plant oh, okay. where? Well, if you don't remember all that, you can put in tomato plant family, and it'll give you a list of what things. What to plant. Yeah, it'll give what? you things that are in that family, or you can put in squash family, and it'll tell you what's in there. If my garden's like the 24 foot by 24 foot, if I'm rotating, can I just rotate by rows or do I need to rotate that whole area? If you've got what you've got on this end? Yeah. Can I move it, it to the other end yeah. next year? Okay. That, unless. For, for further the better. Okay. Yeah. All honesty. You know, the it's specific the area, with insects, you know? Yeah. If you right. just move to the other side of the 24 foot garden, um, not they're going to get, they're going to find them. Okay. Know. There's eggs here. They're going to either crawl or fly over, over there. Yeah, That's there. what I was wondering. Okay. Thank you. Is crop rotation something you should do anyway, whether you have disease or not? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And we moved away from that, you know, as a culture, you know, you know, cut pesticides, you know, you know, back in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, it was like, all right, we don't have to do anything else but just spray pesticides on stuff, and you know, we can grow crops. But prior to that, I mean, that you know, crop rotation was a staple practice in agriculture production. We kind of moved away from it because it was just like, well, we can just spray it and not worry about it. And that we found out that wasn't the answer. So yeah, definitely, um, 20, you know, two, three year cycle rotation is probably the best idea. When we get into the garden, you'll see we have uh, a whole array of like a four by 12 raised beds. Um, so within that, you can start kind of blocking and, and, and create a plant 
and, and just moving those plant families around in that array of beds. Uh, if you can build four or five beds uh, at home, then you can start building that into your crop schedule. So you don't have to necessarily give up anything for, for a significant period of time, um, unless you see a real, real bad problem. Like a squash, you know, once you get like squash wars in the area, <laughs> you probably want to take a year or two off. Yeah, but there are some squash varieties that that do a little better. Uh, I can't remember the name of that one. It's long. Uh, what is it? Tatumi, and uh, what was the one Larry grows? Uh, starts with C, but is that the same thing? Mm -hmm. They root at the nodes, so you may have to let them run across your yard. But uh, but they and the squash is more like a zucchini, but you can't leave it on in the winter, and it becomes more like a, a butternut. It's but a those, kind of kind of a cita. There you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so those that's an option too. Um, so you can try that. He says his neighbors really like. It. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Okay, uh, we will expect to. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear what you've grown, what you've had trouble with, that sort of thing. You can use hotline for that. We are going to go out into the gardens, and we also want you to, to visit our posters and our, be sure you look at the live field bug, so you know that one. Uh, and uh, we have some people who are going to go, uh, some master gardeners who will be out there I've got some little cards on things uh, that we did. They're still there, but I put some more. And uh, they'll they'll help you find some of the pests to look at and some of the diseases. <coughs> you want to have, have them identify themselves? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, raise your hand. You're going to be a helper. Uh, Christina's going to be out there, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Tom, back there at the back. Dan, uh, Janice, and Ron will be out there. Uh, you can ask them questions and uh, look for things. Okay? All right. Uh, you guys go first, and then we'll let everybody else go. Uh, so, if you've got leaf foot in the 